Welcome back and welcome to the future. Uh, we have spent the entire day today getting a brief taste and dipping our toes into the water in fashion, music, entertainment, a little bit in film. And now we have with us a group of brilliant panelists. And you will forgive us and them for being white men, but for, for, day, for this purposes, it will all be OK. Uh, two of them you already know, John Taplin and David Wolfe. And they are being joined by um, Siva Vyadhyanathan. Siva is an, a professor at New York University in cultural history and communication. And he is the author of Copyrights and Copy Wrongs, The Rise of Intellectual Property and How It Threatens Creativity. And his newest book is called The Anarchist in the Library. Siva has written for everyone from um, the New York Times to Salon to Open Democracy in the Nation. And he is a um, a wonderfully articulate man, and uh, uh, we're thrilled to have him here. To Siva's right is John Seely Brown, affectionately known as JSB. JSB, as Ted Cohn perhaps did not know when he made the mention of Xerox Park, has been the, was the chief scientist at Xerox Park for 20 years. JSB <laughs> sits on the board of many, many corporations, including Amazon. Um, uh, Corning, Polycom, Varian Medical Systems. He's also on the board of several nonprofits, including the MacArthur Foundation. John Silly Brown is a scientist and a Renaissance man, and we are thrilled to have him here. And our last, our, lastly, our moderator is Rick Carr. Rick Carr, where is Rick? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm really doing this. Rick is a dear friend. Rick is a, a broadcast and print journalist who uh, was a regular contributor to NPR for many years. And has now he's an adjunct professor now at, at Columbia University. And he is now launching a new career where he is developing a series called Technopop for television, how technology makes and unmakes popular music. Uh, and this panel is going to devote itself to the convergence of technology, music, film, and uh, fashion in the future and see where we're going to go from here. So without further ado, Rick. Um, I guess to some extent, it's our food. I'm just going to slide right off the stage there. Um, to some extent, what we're going to be trying to do here is uh, synthesize some of what we've heard today because um, trying to get the different constituencies here to speak the same language uh, isn't always easy. Um, I think that everybody thinks of things differently. The industries work differently. And in order to further confuse things, I'm actually going to start by turning to John Seeley Brown, who I guess represents the geek contingent in all of this. Um, and I want to say, uh, JSB, what, what does a geek think of all this that we've been hearing today? <laughs> You know, it's very simple. I'm going to give up the visual world, the, 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 the virtual world, and live here in the physical world. There's so many <laughs> wonderful things that uh, I, clearly I've been missing something. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the other thing I, I would say is that I don't think in today's high tech world our game is that different from some of the things I've seen today. If you really look at how do we do innovation in the open source communities, you'd be amazed at how much we borrow, how much we build on each other's work. And, and maybe we ought, to, we ought to explain that for the, some of the people um, from the fashion industry who might not necessarily be plugged into what we mean when we say the open source community. What do we mean by that? Well, the open source community is basically um, enables people around the world using the internet to collaborate in building very, very complex systems such as a Linux operating system, which I personally thought could never be built that way. I was just dead wrong. Uh, and then on top of that, there's more and more and more layers of brand new types of application software and so on. All of this software is constructed by the community on their own time, basically, and given back to the community. And so basically, if you take something like Linux, you will find several thousand people participating in the construction of this, but also the maintenance of this, the constant improvement of this, and so on. It is, in fact, a distributed worldwide community effort. I think of it as kind of the rise of the amateur, going back to the, the meaning of amateur in Latin, things that you do for passion. Um, and yet, this is really beginning now to drive the pace of innovation inside the, for business, for the, for the commercial world as well. So there's some very, very deep kind of interplays here. I think the other thing um, that's really struck me as I was asking you is at, at the break, um, you know, the, the technology world carves things up 
in terms of kind of rectangles, planar surfaces, and so on. And now, finally, we're getting enough compute power that now we start dealing with flow. We start dealing with dynamics. You look at Frank Gehry's constructions, the flow, the wonderful curves, the very complex things. And I think that that is, as, um, as Lev was saying earlier, um, is starting to change the vocabulary. Uh, of how we look at the world. I think we now have new set of tools and many of the designs I saw today, the whole ability to kind of capture that, uh, the swirl. I mean, the swirl is a very hard thing to compute. Uh, and how that actually works now, um, that's beginning to change the, the way the technologists look at the world. And I think that's going to end up changing the vernacular of a lot more things like you've already seen it play out in architecture. Mm -hmm. And so I think the last thing I would say uh, we can come back to any of these points later, but is there's a new type of vernacular that is beginning to emerge. You know, you, you talk about some having to do with kids that grow up digital. I mean, how do they in this wild west world really look at the world? And what, is, what are their vernaculars? What are their meanings of screen languages? How do they compose screen languages? And the screen language of film, the screen language of games, the screen language of navigation, the screen language of entrainment. How do these things all come together in very interesting ways? I want to go over to David Wolf and ask, you know, we've seen very clearly in the music industry that the rise of computing power has enabled this amateur thing. I mean, Danger Mouse earlier today, that could not have happened without the computing power that allowed him to do that. Is that happening in the fashion industry? Is computing power actually changing the way that designers and manufacturers do business? Sure. It's changing systems. I mean, it's making the industry much more efficient in terms of delivery and fulfillment and inventory control and all kinds of stuff that is really boring but moves the merch. Uh, I think uh, it certainly is enabling designers to access that word again, inspiration, uh, yeah, so readily, everywhere. I mean, everything is accessible. But I'd, I'd just like to say one thing. I, I heard a word just now that I haven't heard today, and I think it's missing from this entire conference, and I think it's at the root of it, passion. I think creativity and passion are one and the same. And I, the thing that bothers me, I, I, I certainly think artists should be compensated for what they do, but I don't think anyone should be using their creative juices just to make money. If that's what it's about, then, then it's commerce, it's not creative, and it's not art, and protect it forever, because I'm not interested. I want the next thing, and I have a passion for it, and I'll, I'll create it for nothing. Just, I mean, in the same way that, I mean, all these young people seem to understand that there's a creative synergy in our society that, uh, that, that fashion kind of backed into accidentally because they couldn't not do it. But I think the, the world of technology in the future is, is being built in a synergistic new kind of socialism, a, a, a techno-socialism, <laughs> and that is going to change everything. And there's passion beyond the individual. Yes. It's how ensembles can come, come together and have passion that way, too. Yes, you know, tribal it, passion. Right. But, but we also have to remember that, like, Bob Dylan's first album sold 5,000 copies. And his second album didn't reach gold until 24 years after he had put it out. So he didn't get up every morning and say, I'm going to go to work to make money. He just wanted to get to make another record. And, and that's something I want to kind of get into here for a second. The, the way that the music business has changed and the way that technology has changed that, this amateur thing again, the big commercial part of the music business now, an artist like Bob Dylan probably wouldn't get a chance to make that second record. And I wonder if you, John, and Siva could both kind of talk about the business structures in these two industries, say music and film on one hand and fashion on the other, and kind of it, it, do, do these, the, the business structures seem to be so different, yeah, the frameworks. But they're, so. they're changing. I, I use the term that we're in an interregnum. And if, if you think back to when King Charles I was, had his head cut off, and then there was 15, 20 years before King Charles II was brought up, it was a very wild and dangerous and violent time. And that is where we are right now. We're, the old king is dead. The analog world is dead. And the digital world is just beginning to emerge. And I mean, some of the passion you heard on the stage when I was, my guys were up here, was they would like the changes to have some meaning to their lives. Well, Sam Phillips is a, a, one of the great singers. And 
in this new world, she perhaps could make a living for the next 20 years, putting out and selling 50, 70, 100,000 copies and be as happy as a clam. And she can do that in a digital world. But sh she is of no interest to a big record company at this point. If, if their world is bounded by Us Magazine on one side or Vibe on another side and, and MTV and all of that, I mean, she's not going to go push a lot of products. So but even so, Sam Phillips remains successful. She remains important. She remains uh, able to connect with a large, rather diverse, um, hopefully growing fan base. But what you can sense from her comments and contrast it with the tone and the diction of the people who you heard from in the fashion industry, you might agree with me on this, there is a deep difference in the level of confidence uh, with, with which uh, creative people are speaking in these, t in these two industries. And I think it relates to the relative level of exploitation uh, that creative people find themselves in, in these, in these different industries. Um, the, the, the true creative minds, the, the Tom Fords, uh, in the fashion industry have a sense of themselves and therefore they don't have to carry around a level of anxiety. They don't have to worry how their work may be resonating, echoing through the culture. In fact, they, they can actually read those echoes and be quite proud of it. Um, and that's, that's something that we unfortunately don't hear enough of from songwriters and musicians. Uh, their communities are full of anxiety, full of questions. Some of it is justified and some of it, I'm, I'm afraid, is not quite as justified as, as they might, uh, they might uh, uh, pretend. It's, um, uh, you can sense it with the, the ambivalence about sampling, for instance. Uh, the ambivalence about sampling that musicians of, uh, of all genres uh, express when you talk to them about this. Um, and it is divorced from their particular financial relationship with the industry or their financial agreement, even if it's unstated, with their, with their fan base. Um, and, and, and only a handful of musicians uh, have uh, the sense about sampling that, that sort of track with how people in the fashion industry talk about uh, how their work echoes through the culture. Um, and I think that if, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, to, to, if, if, if Oscar Wilde were more familiar with the club scene of the late 20th century, uh, he might say something like, uh, the only thing worse than being sampled is not being sampled. <laughs> uh, because, because to be sampled is to be appreciated or sometimes to be criticized. Uh, uh, and, and to be connected with the culture is to sample. Uh, to be cultural is to share. To be human is to be cultural. And to be human means to experience interactions with other people in a circle rather than some straight line of production and distribution. Uh, so what we have are certain cultural industries that are not modeled along our more familiar ways of human interaction. And this is, this is what creates the dissonance. And this is what creates the anxiety. So people in the fashion industry have some sense, and you heard it several times today, that they are plugged into the culture. And without being plugged into the culture, without being fully cultural, they have no way of doing their jobs well. In fact, I wrote down a bunch of the phrases that Kevin Hall used uh, when, when discussing what he does. And it wasn't just about how he riffs on other uh, historical figures in his field. Uh, he used words like style, gesture, mix. He used mix, and that struck me as a very musical way of speaking. Uh, iconic, right? He talked about icons, ways that, that particular images and messages work their way through. Um, uh, he talked about, about hand draping. He talked about it with joy, because that's about craftsmanship. And craftsmanship is the other half of this. You know, if craftsmanship plus passion equals creativity. Uh, and so he had a sense that craftsmanship is deeply important to this. Um, he talked about his influences as his teachers. They're his teachers. And that, that reminded me of a, a quote from Ralph Ellison. In, in 1954, he wrote an, ed an article in Partisan Review in which he, he stated, you know, we can't choose our relatives, uh, but we can choose our ancestors. Uh, and I, th I think that that's a really important thing to remember when we talk about the ways that all of these different cultural influences work together to weave a cultural tapestry. Um, and, and, and that's really the key here. Uh, what, we've, what I've learned from the people in the fashion industry I've, I've met and talked to this weekend uh, is that they feel a deep desire to be fully connected with the cultures around them, whether that comes through magazines or television or walking in the street. Uh, and, I, and it's really 
uh, viscerally exciting in ways that I wish more musicians could express. Why do you think musicians aren't, though? And you, I don't know if you agree or not, John Taplin, but it's... it's because I think they feel that we're in a moment where the forces of what happens have, have got much more to do with how you look, you know, what your deal is, you know, Rich was saying, you know, how many times have you been shot, you know, it, it's that kind of uh, stance, attitude that you're taking and, you know, it, it, it ultimately, um, I, I still believe in music, it comes down to good songs, good players, good singers and passionate craft. There, there is not that uh, piece of the puzzle in terms of what ends up on the top of the pop charts. I mean, you, could, you know, how many times have we seen that these people are fakes in the sense that they're, they're lip syncing, they can't really sing unless there's something in their ear, you know. I mean, these people look good or they undress well, but that doesn't have anything to do well, with music. Okay, but John, you know? that's, that's we call not necessarily to do. I mean, look, I mean, like we said, you know, look, the, I mean, the number one hit of 1967 was Sugar Sugar by the Archies, right? This is not a new phenomenon. This, this level of bubble gum is, is something that we've been living with for, for centuries. Uh, that's not the problem. But, but one of the things I've noticed is this level of anxiety uh, seems to increase with the uh, length of an artist's a uh, rather successful career. So someone like Sam Phillips, who's, who has a body of work to be envied by any singer-songwriter in the world, um, expresses that. It doesn't mean that when she gets in the studio or when she picks up her guitar, she feels any less a craftsperson or any less connected with the culture. Um, and, 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 and that's the key. I mean, she clearly can separate that moment of, of passion and craftsmanship and creativity from the moment when she has to be uh, a representative of her, of her art and her work in, in a forum like this. Um, so I'm not, I didn't mean to imply that artists are jaded in their entire lives uh, or that, that songwriters are so jaded, but uh, but we all know that the, the really exciting notion, I mean, when we were talking about, well, when I was listening to people in the fashion industry discuss the extent to which they're connected with the culture at large, I kept thinking that Bob Dylan you know, wrote about um, uh, you know, wrote about Halston and brand new leopard skin pillbox hat. I mean, there's this, this notion that he was so connected with the, the wider culture, uh, even at that point in his career. Um, and and that's, that's the essence. So what we have now to, to connect to open source, uh, you know, open source is this phrase that we're all very, very much into right now. We're very much abuzz with, with open source models of, of production and distribution. And the key to open source is that you're not going to be selfish about the nuts and bolts, the pieces, that you're going to allow other people to mix and match your stuff. Uh, to have an open source attitude to the world is to, is to be less uptight about people messing with your stuff because you know that you only got where you are because you messed with other people's stuff. Is, is to be ready to share, basically. Exactly. Okay. Right. So, I, you know, a lot of what's going on in the background, I want to know if, if uh, our cultural futurist on the panel, uh, David Wolf, uh, we hear a lot about this kind of like construction of celebrity and its use in marketing various forms of culture, the construction of celebrity in hip hop. In fact, the construction of celebrity before there's even any product for the hip hop artist to sell, right. meaning there's no rap, but we know the guy's been shot 80 times. Right. So yes. I, I, I think that's symptomatic of, of a, a social malaise and the breakdown of the family and the dumbing down of our education system. Uh, we don't know who we are, and we get up in the morning and we think, uh, what would Jennifer Aniston wear today? That must be me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so I, think, I think it's, uh, it, I, I hope it, somehow we'll find a cure, but, but doesn't I it, don't think so. I don't, see it in, I don't see it in my lifetime. I mean, doesn't that go back to what you were showing us this morning, though, when you gave us that, that sort of thumbnail sketch of the history of the fashion industry? That yeah. seems to go back to the 50s in, yeah. in the fashion industry of putting famous people in the front row at the, at the show. I, I, are people going to get no, sick of that? Are they no. going to rebel? Okay, the big difference is the, the famous people were in the front row to buy the clothes. They weren't there to have their picture taken. That's the big Very difference. Good. Yep, but, but, but the picture. But, here, but the here's, picture. Was. Here's the other problem, Rick. I mean, I, you know, someone mentioned the notion of product placement. It was just kind of grazed over uh, in the earlier panel. But if you look at a lot of television today, it is so filled with product placement, and this is stuff that is paid for, bought, sold. You know. And boy, on American Idol, they're going to make sure that the Coke can logo is right there in your face all the time. And it does seem to me that there's going to come a time when there was going to be, a, a, you're going to hit a wall. 
at, culturally, where people are going to just be so fed up being sold every minute of the day that maybe they will want to have less in the same sense that you were saying, hey, maybe we got to start paring down what we wear, simplifying. I think people are going to want to start turning off things. And, you know, you may pay more to not be sold. You know, you may be willing to pay, I mean, what is HBO? You're paying to not be sold. And that well, is and, perhaps and to hear, and to hear the, the F next word. place. <laughs> yeah, but, but I don't think that's the point. You know, I think the avoidance of commercials and the ability to do something a little cutting edge is, is why that's a successful service. And I think we're going to try and figure out ways to get around it and the marketers are going to constantly try and hit you with an email on your cell phone saying, hey, if you walk down two blocks to the right, you, there's a store that's going to give you 10% off this thing. And how are you going to get out of this world? You know, I mean, that's the problem for me. Okay, so I don't know if this is too big of a leap, but I think as I, because I, I live most of my life online, not on, you know, HBO or watching broadcast media, despite the fact that I actually work in them. Um, I, the, the, um, the thing is that in the online world, there are, it's really easy to form subcultures. Don't networks, John C. Lee Brown, let us really sort of easily form subcultures, form connections with people? I mean, I notice this in music, this fragmentation of genre that to me seems to be empowered by technology. Right. I mean, I think if you go back to the curve that, that John threw up at the beginning of the morning in, in terms of the long tail distribution, which I think is so fundamental to the new games you're walking into. I mean, as, how do you move from a supply push world, which is what your placement ads are really about, right. to a demand pull world in which basically media and advertising, if you wish, become more like Google ads, which actually only happen in very, very you know, pinpointed cases. The essence of that power, that, that, that you know, long tail distribution, is that that is actually the number of niche communities that can actually exist. And what we really have, I think the most fundamental trend we have going forth now is the rise of the niche communities. And small little creative niches can actually find each other, can create, and their identities start to get structured and, and crafted by their kind of participation in and creation for those niche communities. Now it's interesting, niche communities themselves are fractal. So if you want to understand how viral, how viral marketing works correctly when it does, you got to look at how these niche communities stack up in very interesting ways. So I think we're into a completely new type of game that I think that advertising mass media does not understand. But I think that this rise, the power of the niche community, um, and then how does identity get constructed by being a part of one or multiple niche communities, and how do you create for them, I think is going to be a, a very fundamental mechanism John, while I agree, I, I don't think it's all that new. I think what we're seeing is, an, is, is uh, that digital technologies and network communication have, have amplified right. more than created uh, habits, cultural habits. They've, uh, they've brought them into sharper relief. They've allowed uh, people to, well, they've made sure that we can't ignore the, these habits. Uh, but they, they're not necessarily uh, uh, new. Now, the digital technologies have done two things in these areas of creativity, two major things. Um, uh, people in my business love to simplify things into two or three things, right? So uh, one is uh, uh, lowered the barriers of entry to uh, to the pr process of creativity, production and distribution. But the other thing is that they've sped up the feedback process. They've allowed us uh, to immediately see uh, that we've made something great. Like, you know, Danger Mouse found out within days that people all over the world really dug his work. Uh, and he didn't find that out because he got a big check from anybody, because he didn't. He found that out because he started getting emails from people, because people started whispering about it, because, uh, because niche community started buzzing about it. And he could read the level of buzzing uh, now through these, uh, these networks of digital communication. Right. Exactly. Uh, and that's what's really exciting about it. This is what has, has, has created this new level of uh, of, of, of passion. So from a push model of creativity to a conversation, as we were talking mm -hmm. earlier. But there's What's lots, return? There's lots That's of other nice. examples in the sense of, you know, the Indian film industry makes 800 films a year. And there are about a million eight Indian immigrants in the United States. And yet the biggest Indian film last year got into three theaters in the United States. Okay, so that's clearly an underserved audience and whenever you go into an Indian grocery store you see that little rack of 
beat up cassettes that are sitting there that the guy will, you know, have a side business renting Indian movies. Well, the net all of a sudden makes it possible to reach that community and let them download those movies and have access to a wealth of material that they never had before. And that can't help but to be a good thing. Okay. Right. And that's just the beginning of the yeah. game. I mean, because now if you look at how do you start to do your remix in this world, and you look at things like the Creative Commons licensing, now you have automatic ways of being able to trace the history of the remix. So you now have a very interesting way of actually feeling like I can now show that I'm a part of something else. Right. So I want to, I don't, here's another big leap, but I want to see how the panel deals with it. I'm actually going to throw this to, to David Wolf. This stuff about technology now, in terms of enabling these subcultures, does that change the way that people react to fashion? And what it makes me think is, is there ever going to be another Tom Ford? Is there ever going to be another generation of designers who come up and really dominate the world? Or are we going to see this kind of fragmentation? Something I, I've been talking to all, all my clients about maybe is the fact that there is no more mainstream. And, uh, and I don't think it's a cultural mainstream, but especially in the fashion industry because the industry was predicated and built on understanding where you as a designer or a manufacturer or a retailer fit in relationship to the mainstream. You're either in front of it, in it, or behind it. And you could you could tune your creativity and, and your business growth to that measure, and it's gone. I, the, the fashion industry, you know, like so many other sectors, it, it isn't awake yet to the fact that a revolution has happened. Mm -hmm. There is no mainstream. You know, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, one out of every 25 American women bought a poncho, and people think, oh, fashion is alive and well. No. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if one out of if one out of 25 Americans bought any given record that came out, that would be you know that's 10 million records right there. That's a big hit. See, you're such a numbers person. So bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> but is that? I mean, okay. So so, um, what's driving that? Uh, why is the fashion industry behind? Of course, we hear the music industry. We hear people complain the music industry is behind on it too. But why is the fashion well, industry? It, it's like every giant. It, it's it's easier to turn a speedboat than to turn an ocean liner. <laughs> it, it's it's it, it will change. It has to, it, it is changing slowly. But isn't the very notion that there is that the fashion industry cannot be anything but uh, immersed in its market? Like its feedback loop is is fairly refined, right? Its feedback mechanisms are fairly refined. They, they have agents among all of us, right? Figuring out yeah. what we really dig and yeah. what we might dig next. And, and the 12-year-olds the are hanging out in the park near your house, what they're wearing. You know, that, that really precise feedback mechanism is probably what is going to avoid a great crash, don't you think? Yes. Well, I don't think there would be a great crash. I think there would just be a fra an, in an intense fragmentation. <laughs> I think it will, the numbers will be the same, but they will be, the, the pie will be in many, many pieces instead of one great big Gucci quiche. <laughs> but you know, the, it's a curious issue is you go into this radical defragmentation, there is a greater need because of that to have something that does pull us together, okay? It's a community of imagination, whatever that, okay? Now think about now the rising importance of public art and public architecture is a way to create a common experience for these highly fragmented communities. What is, does, yeah, and does fashion play a role in that? Right, or is that it, is, question, it, yeah. is it self-expression? And, and this is a question that we've kind of heard danced around a couple of times today. When we talk about it, is it self-expression? Are any of these lifestyle choices, when you talked about televisions and things like that, are they self-expression or are they opting into an overculture and maybe that's what we don't know, John Taplin. Maybe that's the problem, is that we as a society haven't figured out yet if these things are self-expression. All of these choices that are available to us that weren't before um, are, are, are aspects of self-expression, or whether we want to buy into, what's my neighbor have? Does well, he have the Toshiba I mean, flat screen? First off, we have a, a shattering of, of political self-expression. So that, you know, people used to uh, identify and, and certain music identified with certain political stance, identified with certain wardrobe choices. You know, it was, I mean, the 60s, that was a fairly simple construct that you could put together. That doesn't exist anymore. And so perhaps the, the notion of many, many ways of, of see, uh, seeking identity, both in dressing like uh, Brad or Jennifer or, or dressing or acting a certain way or, or identifying with a certain kind of music, uh, maybe that's 
the next way of self-expression. But I think there's a frustration that you heard earlier this morning that, that that's, that's not good enough at this point. I mean, you know, there's, where is the Bruce Springsteen? Where is the Bob Dylan? Where is the voice that a larger, maybe that's what John is talking about, where is the voice that a larger group of people could get behind? I mean, the notion of a, a Beatles arriving three months after John Kennedy was dead and 75 million people watched the Ed Sullivan show on one night and the whole country just went crazy with it, that's hard to imagine that that could even happen today. Yeah, but that is, I mean, in some sense, if you look at the kind of rapid interconnection of the blog, blog world, okay, when that interconnection suddenly happens, a, a zeitgeist has been touched. In some sense, I think of the, the blog world as almost the social subconscious mind. And when enough interconnections happen because of some set of events, then that reaches the social conscious mind, i.e., it gets to the newspapers. I mean, I think that this whole vibrant interactions down below the surface um, is what we have to pay much more attention to. And I think that you know, we, things, when things resonate just right, bang, they come out. All right. So it's, it's all about, the, I, I keep this all day long, what keeps coming up is the media, the media, the media. I think there's a subculture that, that, that is so much more interesting. And I, I, I think, you know, I, I'm so old, I'm the oldest person in the world. I remember, I remember what it was like before the 60s, you know, and, and, and when, the, when the subculture, you know, rose and became the establishment and there was a revolution. And I think that revolution is, is brewing now under the surface. And I think it's all about the, the being able to connect globally with tiny little groups of similar people of similar interests uh, who want to dress like you or think like you or read like you or vote like you or whatever. And, and, and that, when that raises to the surface, I think we're going to can, see a new world. Can right. I raise one, just one other point that I haven't heard at all today, which is that we have to also realize that we're living in a world culture today and that it could be that the Chinese or the Koreans or the Indians have a very different view about this than we have right here and that they are creating their own cultures. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago, I could have told you that Baywatch is the most sold television show in the world, right. that it's uh -huh. sold more countries in the world. Today, that's not true. There isn't a single American television show that's sold everywhere around the world. In other words, because of these digital technologies, the Koreans are making their own television shows and the Chinese are making their own television shows. So we've still got a fairly, you know, notion that Michael Jackson could sell 70 million albums of, you know, of Thriller or 50 million albums. That isn't going to happen anymore either. So we've got to begin to think about Alt, other cultures shipping their ideas to us. You know, the old notion of cultural imperialism is, is a total joke. But that's, isn't that already happening with things like, I mean, you look, you drive around the, a lot of the bookstores in LA and you see non-Asian kids buying Japanese comic books, buying Korean comics, Korean tchotchkes. Uh, what's the little, uh, the Korean girl character now who I'm seeing everywhere? No, not Hello Kitty, it's uh, P Piku, something like that? Mm -hmm. Pika, yeah. Yeah, just this little, you know, it's, it's that, okay, so now the Koreans are in, in that business competing with the Japanese on that line. Um, I want to I wanna ask an, uh, another question, something that, that I thought was kind of coming up today and that we haven't necessarily addressed, and it is, have we figured out yet where the bright line is, or is there a bright line between influence and copying? Some people who sat on this stage today seem to act as though there was. I know that there are at least a couple of people on this stage right now who don't think that there is, and I wonder if that might be some of the cultural anxiety that we have to deal with moving forward. What's the line between influence and copying? Is there a bright line? Anybody? Nobody? There is not. There's not. Siva's the one. See, I knew that Siva would say that there's not. There's not a bright line between it. But this is this is the thing, and this is the like sort of trying to get these two com two communities, get the fashion community and the, the music community, everybody else, to talk about this stuff. Don't we approach these things really differently? I mean, I guess that's the point of why we're here today, isn't it? Well, the law clearly approaches these things very differently, and the law in the world of music is deaf to the notion that there is not a bright line, that it is a gradient and that people approach that gradient
from different perspectives, um, which is why the law has been so disruptive, both on the creative side and on the business side, either too strong or too weak, probably both, depending on where you are in, in terms of the business. Uh, and that's the crazy story of music. The beautiful story of fashion is that because the cultural regulation is so light, uh, we've, w what we've heard today is that, uh, is that people can feel free to build, feel free to create. They, they're just not worrying about drawing a bright line very much, um, except for uh, perhaps the lawyers who work for Chanel, uh, who seem to be willing to s try to figure out where that line is. Um, so we heard sort of echoes of that. Uh, but again, we know that the creators aren't, don't have a hang up about that bright line. Didn't we hear, I, I, go, go ahead. I take a slightly contrary view on that, in the sense that I do believe that songwriters who've created something, um, we have to figure out mechanical, serious ways to compensate people <laughs> for their stuff. And the problem is that if it's not mechanical, meaning if you want to do a cover of someone's song, you can do it. You don't have to ask anybody a permission, but they still get paid their two cents a record, and, and it's all, it, there's no negotiation. So you don't spend a lot of time with lawyers and everything. There is nothing like that in sampling. There's nothing like that if I want to quote or, or take a little clip for a documentary I'm making and put it into a new documentary. There's no way to do it. It's all an individual negotiation, and it makes for a dead culture. And so I think we need to go, I mean, I don't buy into the whole Creative Commons, everything should be free nonsense. I believe that we have to just figure out business models and mechanical royalties that work so that the artist gets compensated and the, you know, the new artist who's reconceiving things can do it without having to hire a pack of lawyers and go through the hassles that Norman, I mean, not everybody has the, the, the chutzpah of Norman saying, we're going to put, you know, God bless America on, let him come sue us, you know? I mean, most people get scared off long before they get to that point. John, I'm happy to report that that is, exact, that is exactly Creative Commons' vision for how creators should be able to interact with the next generation of creators. Creative Commons is not about making everything free. Right. Creative Commons is not okay. about radical uh, release of, it's about using the copyright system in a subtle and humane way to allow creators themselves to dictate the terms of distribution. It, it, is, it is empowering at the individual level and therefore shifts many of the decisions away from the corporations who are seeking the, the bright line that is causing so much trouble. Um, so it is actually about about, about bringing the decision making to the individual. Uh, and what that happens though, is what happens with that is once you realize that um, all rights need not be reserved, that you can feel good about saying, um, if you're gonna use my song in a commercial, uh, you better pay me and my license, my Creative Commons license will say that. But the same songwriter building his own Creative Commons license can say, but you know, if you're gonna use my song in a club mix, go right ahead. Or if you are going to combine my song with four other canonical songs and give me the greatest praise in the world, feel free with that. But you know, some of the songwriters don't even want to do that. They can still use the Creative Commons license to lock people out of that. So it is a mix and match way. It's a way of building your own terms of distribution. And that's what's really beautiful about the thing. So it's not an either or. It's not uh, a total freedom or total lockdown situation. So it's, uh, and, and, it, that's, and it's built on the open source model. Right, it's opened up a whole spectrum mm -hmm. of what, what becomes mechanical. Right. And, Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, with the Creative Com the Creative Commons is a project and is, is, is Glenn Glenn's, Brown here? Glenn's here. Glenn yeah. Brown, he had to leave. Okay, so he left. He was, he's the guy from Creative Commons who was here. It's something that uh, kind of grew out of some work that uh, Larry Lessig, the, the copyright scholar and, and writer, uh, has been doing and a bunch of other people. And basically it's a way of saying, uh, if you create something, if you write a song or a book or whatever it is that you create that can be copyrighted, you can say, no, I'm actually going to release this under the Creative Commons license, and you have a bunch of choices. You can say, you can do what you want with this as long as you attribute it to me. You can make that attribution pass on so that, like, if I write a song and Siva covers it, 
and I have the attribution share alike license. That means that he's got to, if he gives it to somebody else and lets them do what they want with it, they have the same terms. So you have all these different choices. Creativecommons.org, it's very interesting. Flip it back to the fashion industry though. We heard this story earlier today, and I've heard this before, of young designers doing something super cool, not being able to tool up in time. Big designer comes along and says, I know that I can crank out 50,000 of those and sell them for five times the price. So is this vision of this open flowing world something that's really great for creative people, David Wolf? I have a real problem with that because I suspect the young designer hasn't done anything original. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I'm so cynical. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. But I mean, when, when Tom Ford said, you got to have two sleeves, we've got two arms, Oscar <laughs> de la Renta once said something to me that, that nailed it for me. He said, look, you're dealing with the human body. We can either go in and out, up and down, bright or dark. And there are, there are uh, the sensitive people have the right rhythm of when to do it. So, so I, I have a real problem about saying something is so original. And I, I think the entire industry works on sampling. And our, our sampling is different than the music sampling. <laughs> We buy the garment uh, and uh, the whole thing, and, uh, and you can't just sample a sleeve, and uh, and it's just the way it works. And I'm sorry, it's a tough game, uh, and sometimes it hurts. So, and with that, I've just been I've been getting the I've been getting the sign from the from the side over here, which I think means that we can go to some questions if anybody wants to. Uh... There's no crying in fashion. <laughs> There's only crying in fashion, honey. <laughs> Whining. <laughs> All right, and since I can't see, oh, right there in the middle, first microphone Thanks, to the first I, mouth. Go ahead. You, uh, great, great discussion. Um, one question why I have, which is one an observation and one is a question. Um, where does moral rights fit in all of this? I know that under American law, of course, um, for those that don't know, I'm a lawyer, by the way, so sorry. Um, <laughs> Where do moral rights fit? Moral rights is a recognition under French law and other European nations that the creator not only creates a product, but also a form of the, his or her persona. And I think that this is the crux of one of the anxieties that musicians, at least, seem to be talking about and we, I think needs to be recognized. It seems to me that in fashion, the creator is part of such a large collabor collaboration from the very beginning that maybe they're a little more relaxed in that and that they're, they're not giving away so much of their persona so much as say maybe a songwriter singer is I, I and where does that fit isn't isn't Ma though isn't Ma moral rights the underlying thing in the whole uh, smoking well well but my sense of droit moral is that the that the director for instance in a french movie has certain rights that he retains no matter who financed the thing I mean, obviously, they don't exist in America. If, if Walt Disney financed the movie, Walt Disney owns the copyright, lock, stock, and barrel, and the, the creator has his net profit participation, but that's about it. You know, he has no ownership of copyright. Now, what T-Bone was talking about is that some more powerful musicians are reasserting themselves in saying, I want to own my copyrights. I want to own my masters. I want to own everything. And I'm going to lease out these rights to someone to distribute for a period of time for a percentage of the profits. And I'm going to get them back. And that, to me, is where it's all going. I mean, I do think that that ends up an important part of it. Well, the, it's also, um, uh, there's no crying in copyright, and there is no moral rights in American copyright right now. But this is the great cultural dissonance when it comes to discussing and understanding copyright. Uh, to Sam Phillips, she feels deeply morally attached to her work, as every musician I've ever met feels, and justifiably. But there's, no, there's nothing in American law that satisfies her, her, her moral qualms, her moral concerns, her deep feeling of personality uh, attached to that. Now, as I said, some artists can live in that without, without that much anxiety, can, can just accept that there is no moral claim on how their work is used uh, out there. Now, the reason that we don't have moral rights as a strong part of American law is, is complicated. And uh, there's a cool book called Copyrights and Copy Wrongs you can buy if you're really curious about it. Um, or copy it, or borrow it from your library. Uh, but uh, but the, the, the thing is, the lack of moral rights lets us play more lets us play 
with people's stuff with a lot more confidence. Uh, as global copyright gets standardized, the moral rights question becomes uh, one of the great hitches. There's a, a weird moral rights regime in Canada because they have two different legal systems and, and like, you know, Ontario has one different vision of moral rights than Quebec. Uh, but uh, anyway, too much detail. But the, this is going to be the great question when it comes to the fact that when we talk about copyright in public, it's often about what would make the artist feel good about what's happening. And that's not really what it's about. Uh, copyright is, a, is, is purely a state-granted, limited monopoly for a specific economic purpose. It is to create an incentive to distribute. And that's, that's what it's there for, and that's, that's what we hope it works well for. In back, okay. on the left, yeah. I had a couple questions, and I had a comment. You're, yeah, you're audible. Go ahead. Um, no, use the mic, please. Use the, use mic, the mic, please. please. I, just, I can hear myself echo. I hate it. Jonathan, you made a point about, um, you touched on global global participation in music and, and copyright. In particular, we've just been outside the country for four months and we've just come back and we were in Asia. And what's interesting to me about fashion is that it's a thing. I'm perfectly, I understand with music, you can send it over the internet. And fashion is this thing that goes through this process that a lot of people and companies participate in to manufacture. And it surprises me to hear the fashion industry today or who's representative here talk about it being so US centric when everybody wears clothes all, all over the world and they're designed and made all over the world. So I just wanted to throw that in as the, I think the globalization and the cultural aspect and the physicalness of fashion is an important consideration. And so I wanted to comment on that. And also I, I felt that um, as far as young designers go and whether or not they are <laughs> borrowing or original, it seems like we're all borrowing and we have way outside of our lifetimes and why are we just putting this mechanism around this concept now legally when humans have been wrestling this with this for centuries so this is interesting to me and I wanted to comment I enjoyed this panel thanks <laughs> yeah I, I'm uh, can we get a mic down here for for Ted Cohen Ted Ted smart because he knew that this this panel was going to be contentious and he was going to have something to say, so he sat right in front of me. I just wanted to stay till the end. <laughs> no, I, the only thing I was going to say is the concept, I mean, if everybody's seen Ray, the concept of owning your own masters has been around for years. I mean, I'm not as old, I don't know if I'm <laughs> as old as David, but I've watched artists come in, do label deals, come in, they own their masters, they take it with them, they own their copyrights, it's, it's, there's a finite time. If you can cut those kind of deals, I would, you know, I've tried to do it with artists that I've worked with over the years when I left the record company side and went to the management side. So, I mean, it's incumbent upon everyone who's playing in the game, whether it's fashion, whether it's music, to learn what the game is about and not feel like they were victimized later. I think you have to, you have a responsibility as an artist, as a designer, whatever, as a software writer, whatever it may be, to really learn the business that you're getting into so you don't feel victimized later. There's no reason to be. Yeah, but, but look, what, what we're trying to say here, and I think what JSP started off with is, this transition is a transition from a world of scarcity, which when Norman started making TV programs, there were three networks. There were only three buyers. And when I started making movies, there were six studios. And now we're going into a world where scarcity is not an issue anymore because the net is a, a world of infinite choices and anybody who can put a G5 in their basement can serve up music out there. So, but that change of the chokehold of distribution held by a few companies is very hard for them to stomach. And they don't like this idea that scarcity does not exist anymore. And so they're gonna keep putting it off as long as they can and I'm, I'm not picking on EMI because I think EMI is one of the more progressive companies in the world because it's only got one business, music. Unlike many other companies that we all know that have many businesses which, you know, conflict with this uh, deal. Our, our host and benefactor raised his hand, so. Don't, uh, don't we see uh, uh, scarcity in the uh, amount of uh, entities that own all of what you're describing? Three or four entities owning all of the uh, channels, all of the uh, No, I, I, I definitely think 
that in, in the world of television, there's still scarcity and that there's six companies that own everything. But I still believe that the oddball website or the, the, the artist who has access to tools to, to serve up their content can actually get out there. That then comes into the question that Rich raised earlier is how do you find it? How do you find this obscure piece of content that someone is serving out of their basement? And that may be that you start trusting experts to look for stuff for you in the same way that that's, blogs, MP3 blogs. That's the, are, the challenge of filtering and feedback, which are the immature, the inchoate uh, processes. Uh, we've got the production and distribution stuff down in the digital world. It's, it's really about mastering the feedback and, uh, and, and the filtering. All right, we've got to uh, cut this off as much as we could go on for the rest of the afternoon. I'd like to thank everybody. Oh, can we, uh, do we have like one minute to show? We talked about the gray video earlier today. Do we have that up there and can we show that? Just a little bit of it to get a sense of what we're talking about when we talk about these mashups in other media. Uh, to Siva who brought that along. Thanks everybody.